Hello everyone. Today's topic is on applied physiology, uh, part of spinal and epidural anesthesia. Uh, this is a continuation of the topic we did last time, which is applied anatomy in spinal and epidural anesthesia. I am Dr. Samida Varadkar. I am a consultant anesthesiologist at Pilavati Hospital and Research Center in Mumbai. Moving on to our discussion. In this presentation, again, we are going to cover four important components. The first thing is applied nerve physiology, cardiac effects related to, of course, spinal and epidural anesthesia, the epidural benefits uh, for the patient, and high and total spinal. Moving to the first section, the nervous system, as we know, is divided into two components, the central and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is further divided into the afferent or the sensory component, which consists of pain, temperature, touch, vibration, proprioception, smell, hearing, vision, taste, and equilibrium. So all these sensations are transmitted by the afferent or the sensory route. On the other hand, the efferent or the motor, it has two components, the somatic, uh, which is the voluntary, or the autonomic, which is the involuntary. The somatic has no ganglion, only one neuron from the CNS to the effector muscle and single innervation, while the autonomic, which is divided into the parasympathetic and sympathetic, has two uh, neuron systems, has a ganglion and has dual innervation. If you remember this diagram, we also had it in the uh, anatomy section. Uh, so this is, of course, the spinal uh, cord with the central canal, uh, which forms the central nervous system and the ventral and the dorsal root find the, form the spinal nerve, which are the part of the peripheral nervous system, okay? So the green arrows are the afferent or the signals which are brought to the gray matter and the red are the efferent, which cause the action. This is the autonomic nervous system. So let's see the differences between the two sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. So here, uh, the sympathetic system mainly, the, uh, they lie between the thoracolumbar, that is T1 to L2, while this is where the uh, craniosacral areas. The ganglia are close to the CNS in the sympathetic system, while here they are close to the effector organs. Uh, the short uh, preganglionic segment, while the uh, parasympathetic will have the long preganglionic. Sympathetic uh, has uh, is responsible for the fight and flight response, while in the parasympathetic, we have the rest and digest. The mediators responsible for the sympathetic response are the adrenaline and noradrenaline, while acetylcholine is responsible in the parasympathetic system. Now let's see the efferent nerves orientation. So here we, as we have seen in the previous slide, the motor nerve, okay? So you have from the CNS, to the effector organ, right? Uh, so uh, this is the your axonal body, and you can see they are all myelinated nerves. Motor nerves are myelinated nerves, or the type A nerves. They are large and they are heavily myelinated, and because of that, they do fast conduction due to saltatory uh, conduction. The sympathetic system uh, will have preganglionic, and which are lightly myelinated. They are, as you can see, they are short segments and the postganglionic is longer. The postganglionic will be un unmyelinated causing slow conduction. Parasympathetic system uh, has the preganglionic or the lightly myelinated and the, uh, the segment will be longer while the postganglionic will be shorter. And you can see here the intersection. As they have said, there are two ganglia present. Sensory or the afferent nerves. So you have the touch and pressure. So there is light touch and uh, deep touch. So they are conducted by the moderate to heavily myelinated or fast nerve fibers. Pain and temperature has both unmyelinated and lightly myelinated. So as we know, you have A, B, and C. The A are all myelinated, C are unmyelinated, and the B has both myelinated and unmyelinated. A conducts the fastest, while C is the slowest. Okay. Uh, these are predominantly unmyelinated, slow in pure sensory nerves while predominantly lightly myelinated in mixed panel nerves, which are responsible for moderate conduction. So why are we seeing all this anatomy and physiology? Okay, these are like your first year topics. 
So this is why, because we have to correlate it for anesthesia. Um, so we have uh, distribute, like divided this into different sections. Okay, so as you can see the myelination, conduction, the anesthesia effect and the reversal. So when we give final or epidural anesthesia, and when you inject the local anesthetic, um, the response is usually from motor to autonomic and uh, the motor nerves and the two autonomic. So myelinated large are motor while autonomic are unmyelinated or small nerve fibers. The conduction is faster. Yeah, like I previously said, so motor conducts the fastest while autonomic is slowest. However, the anesthesia effect, because they are large fibers, they take longer uh, for the action to uh, be uh, seen or for the action for the local anesthetic to act on those nerves. Hence, the anesthetic effect is slower to start with the motor, but the earliest sign you will see is autonomic, then loss of pain and temperature, then touch and then motor. And the reversal of the effect is exactly opposite. So you will see the motor effect uh, coming first and the last will be pain and autonomic. So what are these related effects of spinal anesthesia? So the order of block, like we just saw, the autonomic uh, towards the motor. So autonomic pain, then temperature, touch, deep pressure, and then motor. So mnemonic can be AP, TTPM, and CBA fiber type, right? So C is unmyelinated to motor, which is A fiber type, which is myel totally myelinated. Recovery, of course, is in the reverse order. So recovery will be from motor, deep pressure, touch, temperature, pain, and autonomic. And you can similarly make a mnemonic of this type and the fiber will be ABC. That is first recovery is in the myelinated and then last is in the unmyelinated because they take longer to recover because they are smaller nerve fibers. The sympathetic block can exceed motor and sensory by two dermatomes. So let us move on and see the cardiovascular effects of smiler and epidural anesthesia. The most predominant effect is vasodilatation. Venous is much more than arterial. And of course, this is restricted to the level of the block. So um, this is very important to know if, if I am doing a case where I don't want hypotension, but spinal anesthesia is the best option available or even epidural anesthesia. I have to understand that I cannot be blocking a lot of dermatomes. For example, if I go anywhere above T10, okay, and especially above T4, I'm definitely going to have significant cardiovascular effects. Hence, it is important to know how much drug volume to give and uh, making sure that you're not reaching a very higher level because that totally, um, uh, you totally lose the purpose uh, of uh, giving safe anesthesia, right? So, um, uh, spinal and epidural, of course, spinal more than epidural, as we have discussed before, will cause significant uh, decrease in preload and you will have uh, vasodilatation and, of course, hypotension. You also see bradycardia, and this is uh, due to uh, these three effects. First is the Bainbridge reflex. Uh, so you have a right atrial stretch receptors which get activated, and then you have the afferent via the vehicle uh, on the medulla, which causes inhibition of the parasympathetic activity. Next can be a direct effect on the SNO due to atrial stretching. And the third is, of course, inadvertent block of T1 to T4 cardio accelerator fibers. Okay, so we have these, uh, the dermatomes between T1 and T4 are responsible for supplying the cardio accelerator fibers. So any block which goes above T4 level will block these nerves and hence you will get a very significant bradycardia and hypotension, total cardiovascular collapse and which is totally not what, what is the plan. That is why whenever you need a very high level of block, it is better to give general anesthesia and probably supplement it with epidural instead of doing any case purely under spinal anesthesia. And whenever you get an anesthetic level, which is above P4, it is called high and of course total spinal, which we are going to discuss later. Treatment is with, um, uh, first you have to allay the anxiety because uh, due to higher levels, you also, your intercostals also get blocked. Patient has subjective dyspnea patient will tell you we can't breathe. Sometimes there is a voice change. So you tell them it is temporary, it's going to go away, right? And you can start with the supplemental oxygen, give IV fluids. Um, you can treat the uh, blood pressure and the heart rate with glycopyrrolate, atropine, ephedrine, and phenylephrine. If there is very significant bradycardia, phenylephrine uh, should be used cautiously and judiciously because phenylephrine on its own will cause bradycardia. Uh, what are the physiological effects of epidural? So, um, of course, as I said, epidural is more gradual. 
it causes less of hemodynamic effects and maybe has a more favorable profile in a high risk patient group and also there is an advantage of clubbing it with general anesthesia right so site of action is nerve roots and a lesser extent by diffusion into the subarachnoid space uh the cardiac effects it favorably alters the myocardial oxygen supply it reduces ischemic events okay so it has got this uh, positive physiological response on the rheology and in uh, uh, that is the that is why it is very good in all high risk uh, groups okay pulmonary also you have favorable effects it maintains the ability to cough and participate in deep breathing so uh, especially when you have uh, upper gi surgeries or you know a major laparotomy and you uh, give a good epidural with your general anesthesia when you are taking patient out of anesthesia or even if your patient is on ventilator your chances of patient recovery and not being patient you know patient should not be ventilator dependent because if you have so much of pain especially in those subcostal incisions patient is going to have splinting on the diaphragm patient is not going to breathe and it is very difficult to wean such patients off the ventilator hence it is uh, it is very very good and very very important to always supplement an epidural as and when and whenever possible with your general anesthetic when doing such cases venous thrombosis also lesser incidence cause uh, epidural leads to increase blood flow in the lower limbs and helps in early mobilization of the patient again because of uh, patient not having pain and he will participate more in the physiotherapy GI function after colon surgery also uh, it is uh, seen to be very good increases mucosal blood flow and bowel peristalsis due to sympathetic block and hence leads to early recovery from the uh, post surgical stress so what is high or total uh, spinal anesthesia these are things which we definitely don't want to have in your practice you don't want to have in your patient but it is important to know uh, what this exactly means high spinal uh, is any level you achieve after spinal anesthesia above t4 level it is uh, often accompanied by hypotension bradycardia respiratory compromise nausea and agitation total spinal anesthesia is when the drug reaches intracranial subarachnoid space which is also of course brain stem anesthesia uh, it presents with paralysis cranial neuropathies coma respiratory and cardiovascular compromise so this is uh, will will be a very very serious thing and uh, you have to um, of course uh, do resuscitation measures so you do airway control ventilation iv fluids simple mimetics and the uh, patient is definitely going to have a cardiovascular collapse so you have to resuscitate patient as per your current aclf guidelines you need to achieve you you need to intubate you need to give inotropes so you are going to do your the basic drill of aclf right so in applied nerve physiology we saw the sequence of blockade and the reversal in cardiac effects we saw bradycardia the causes vasodilatation and of course we must avoid t1 t4 to avoid blocking of the um, cardio accelerator fibers then the epidural uh, benefits okay which are favorable for cardiac gi and for early mobilization of your patient which causes uh, less patient morbidity and mortality right high uh, total spinal of course uh, you have to be avoided and identify early and treat accordingly okay thank you very much and um, we are going to continue this uh, discussion in the uh, future slides okay um this is a part the stock is a part of pedi research surgical clinics if you like this topic and if you have any questions do write in the comment section um don't forget to press the bell icon and subscribe to edi search clinics for many topics on a uh, lot of interesting topics both for medical and non medical uh, professionals okay for layman for patients for everyone they are very simple and easy to understand uh, see you in the next uh, video thank you